Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development at Utah Valley University. In this video, we're looking at the last chapter in the book, which is Chapter 10, Life's Final Chapter, or the chapter on death and dying. Well, aside from the obvious things that dying is the cessation of life, um, it is, of course, part of life, and it's part of the process through which a person develops, or up to which a person develops. Um, and there's the psychological processes that lead up to death. So if a person knows that they're going to die, there's a number of things that go through it. Uh, the best known of these is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Stages of Grief. Now, here's just a simple diagram that says, when a person is confronted with the reality of their own impending death, uh, Kubler-Ross found that people tend to go through a series of five stages in a particular order. Now, it's a stage theory, so Again, there will always be exceptions, but here's how it works. Um, when a person first learns that they are going to die, uh, say, for instance, you have a terminal disease, there's denial that it's not right, it's not going to happen. Um, and then when that can no longer be denied, there is often anger. You know, why is this happening to me? To bargaining, uh, often the form of, you know, dear Lord, I will do anything if you will make this go away. and uh, frequently that doesn't work, and then the person descends into a depression. Um, and given enough time and the appropriate resources, the person can then cycle up through acceptance, which actually is a healthy, seen as a healthy reaction to the death and dying. Now, you'll see these same five stages in a million places adapted to everything along, like how do people deal with new software. Um, I remember seeing it in The Simpsons. Um, I've, there's an interesting variation on it, uh, which extends it to seven stages by talking about simply shock as the very first stage, which you're, you, uh, it, they talk about as paralysis when you get the news, then denial, and then be, after depression but before acceptance is a phase of testing where you're looking at realistic solutions, which, again, may or may not work. Um, so let's assume death is inevitable. The death is going to happen. There is an interesting question about euthanasia. Now, literally, that means good death, and um, also known as mercy killing. And what you get here are very different attitudes for two different kinds of euthanasia, depending on whether a person is highly or religious or low religious, and um, their objections to particular kinds of euthanasia. Now, let me just say, in general, there are two factors. There's what's called active euthanasia and passive euthanasia, and voluntary and involuntary. Involuntary, of course, means that the person didn't choose it, usually because they're in a coma and they're not in a position to say anything. Voluntary means the person is awake, they're lucid, and they made the decision themselves. Um, passive is for when a person is on life support, and, then, and unless you keep doing this thing that is keeping them alive, if you just remove it, they'll die. And so you don't have to do anything. You just have to stop keeping them alive. So removing a ventilator is an example of that. On the other hand, active euthanasia is when you have to create something that makes the person die. And usually what that means is terminal sedation, a drug overdose of some kind that causes the person to die. And the very big question is about the doctor giving it versus the person doing it themselves and whether they're uh, you know, conscious or not. Um, but you get very big uh, differences of opinion on the method of euthanasia. And I think it is still illegal in most states. Um, I know that Jack Kevorkian, who's best known for uh, physician-assisted suicide, went to jail many times. Um, anyhow, let's put that down as an open issue. Now, just to get to some statistics on death, um, you may recall we've talked about leading causes of death in the 65 to 74 group. Um, the leading cause was actually cancer. Heart disease was second place, but it was much lower than cancer. In the 75 to 84, heart disease moves slightly ahead of cancer. And the 85 and older, heart disease is almost three times uh, more common than cancer. I guess the idea is that people who got cancer died already. Um, and that heart disease now becomes the big one. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, there's a lot of different ways to go. and People react to them differently depending on the situation. Now, also they react differently depending on, you know, where they're from and what their expectations are. So, for instance, what to do when someone dies. Um, here we got a Balinese gamelan. That's a uh, sort of a percussion orchestra. Um, funeral. 
It's, it's an official rite of passage. It's a time to recognize that the person is gone, that there are survivors who are often um, in grief. We'll talk about that more in a second. And can provide a funeral can provide a sort of closure to help other people move on with their lives. Um, obviously, it helps if things were emotionally wrapped up beforehand. Um, just about grief and bereavement. Now, grief is a natural response to this kind of loss, and it can lead to bereavement that's that's defined as an emotional state of longing and deprivation that's characterized by grief and a deep sense of loss. And um, the, the amount of time a person feels grief, well, we'll talk about that in just a second. You may recall that uh, there have been traditional um, practices, for instance, if a if a uh, woman if a woman's husband died, that she would wear black for a year um, after. Um, and there may still be people in the U.S. who do that. Um, on the other hand, we can talk a little bit more about ways of dealing with grief and bereavement. Um, now, we talked about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's theory earlier, and that was really about confronting your own impending death. On the other hand, uh, some other researchers have looked at how people react to other people's deaths, for instance, the loss of a... Uh, a parent or a spouse or a child. Um, and John Bowlby, who talked about attachment research, you may remember the secure and avoidant and anxious attachment that uh, we talked about way earlier in the semester. John Bowlby also talked about a stage theory of grief. And in it, he talked about these four stages. He uh, said, talked about them initially being shock and numbness, then the yearning and despair, the disorganization and despair, then a reorganization. These are different from the bargaining and the depression, um, the denial. But you can see there are similarities there. Um, on the other hand, um, Selby Jacobs modified this theory and uh, instead had these stages of numbness and disbelief, separation, distress, which included yearning, anger, and anxiety, then depression and mourning, and recovery. Um, disbelief. Not surprisingly, disbelief is highest at the immediate loss. If if somebody who is close to you dies, and especially if you're not there, um, say for instance they're they're in another part of the country, it's hard to see. It's hard to feel it as a real thing, um, and the disbelief wanes. Uh, for most people, it's over the course of about two years. Obviously, it's going to vary a lot, but two years is common. Also, acceptance, lowest at the beginning, uh, basically non-existent, and then uh, acceptance growing uh, over the two-year period, and yearning, anger, depression, rising suddenly in that order, and then each waning gradually, again, for a common pattern of, of a two-year grief. Now, what's interesting is there's a lot of uh, cultural variation on this. We looked at the Balinese Camelin just a moment ago, but um, we can talk about other holidays. Um, so, for instance, in uh, a lot of European countries where you have a lot of Roman Catholics, people take the day off of work on All Saints Day and All Souls Day, visit cemeteries, take flowers and candles, give kids candy and toys, kind of a big celebration. In Korea, you have the holiday of Chuseok, uh, where you visit shrines and bring offerings. In the Philippines, there's the holiday of Arar Nang Migang Patay, and I know I didn't say that right. But uh, families honor the dead by camping out near their grave sites. And, of course, my favorite here is uh, the Mexican Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, um, celebration of the dead uh, that involves um, party. These are the candy sugar skulls that are handed out. There is uh, also uh, bread, pan de, uh, pan de muertos, um, music, uh, face, you know, it's a big party. And so you get a lot of very big cultural differences in how people deal with death. And I understand, you know, of course, here in the U.S., we're going to have a lot of people, for instance, who you have the cemetery, you go on Memorial Day, you put down flowers. Um, but there is a lot of cultural variation. There's a lot of individual variation over time. And that's all I've got to say for right now. So that is the end of the last chapter in our book. And this is the last video Thank you very much for being with me.